committee. Okay. Can you raise your hands if you actually knew that there was a CESG or its equivalent in your trust? Okay, so my understanding is that every trust in England and Wales, I presume it's for the UK, but I can't comment on Scotland and Northern <laughs> Ireland, uh, has something that is essentially designed to look at new interventions for established clinical indications and uh, new indications using established interventions, okay? And the reason I raise this is because we heard about two important developments in otology just before lunch. One was the use of balloon dilatation of the eustachian tube, and the other was moving from endoscopy as an adjunct to your ear surgery to using it as a primary modality. And certainly at UCLH, uh, my expectation would be if I or any of my colleagues wanted to adopt those techniques, we would go through our CESG. And I think that probably applies um, to all trusts. So you just so uh, Chris said that after giving his talk that you, you're all gonna start doing it tomorrow morning. Well, it's not quite that simple. <laughs> You need to just look at the governance behind it. And it's there to protect patients, it's there to protect you, and there to protect the trust as well. Okay, um, so my brief is to talk about pediatric auditory brain stem implantation. Now this is a very, very niche, low volume, high cost, uh, high potential risk intervention. And the reason I, I'm gonna speak about it is because there are some moral and ethical issues that it throws up. Um, and I think for those of you particularly who might be studying for the, uh, the exams, I think it's worth having an insight into it. For those of you who see children with congenital severe to profound deafness, as you will see, you have, a, a, I think, a responsibility to be aware of this uh, in terms of your referral patterns. So uh, just some uh, uh, acknowledgements to uh, the four main auditory implant companies who have supported me uh, in various ways over many, many years. Uh, I don't have shares in any of them, um, but nevertheless, I have been supported by them. And um, those of you who may well know this uh, building will also be interested to know that in September of this year, we will be moving after, I guess, almost a century, to a new building which will be on the main UCLH campus. So there's a big change occurring and, and eventually the whole of the services here will move into a, a new build, uh, which is an exciting time. But if you want to, those of you who have been at Grazing Road or have been on courses there, if you want to have a final reminiscence relating to this old tired building, you've got till September to do it. Otherwise after that, you'll be gone. I must acknowledge on this particular subject, my colleagues in the, uh, the pediatric brainstem implant team at St. Thomas's and at Guy's Hospital as well. Okay, you'll, be all, you'll all be aware that the massive revolution in otology relates to the development of auditory implants for all types of hearing loss, whether it's something relating to the middle ear, uh, where you can use middle ear implants or bone conduction devices, or the cochlea itself, where cochlear implants come in, and occasionally, and this is a remit of this talk, where you can't use a cochlear implant and where you have to then consider stimulating the brain stem itself. And, and there's no doubt that implantation otology is now an additional subspecialty of otology, uh, and it's here to stay, and it's had a huge impact, not just on clinical practice, but it's driving a lot of discovery science and clinical research as well. So, so for those of us involved in this, and those of you who will be involved in it, it's a great time to be working in ENT and in otology specifically. And, and the cochlear implant is the most successful neuroprosthesis in healthcare. There is nothing that has been as successful as the cochlear implant. It's a great success story. And, and you will know, and, and just testament to that, you can see the global number of cochlear implant recipients. It's probably more than that in reality, and the numbers in the UK almost evenly split between children with congenital profound deafness or adults who have hearing and then develop 
uh, severe to profound deafness. And this is an important slide. It's an old slide now, um, but you can see that if you look at the national picture uh, going back to 1989 when cochlear implants really got going in this country, there was a smattering of cases both in uh, adults in blue and children in red, and then something very substantial happened here in 1995. And basically, that's when the NHS decided to fund it centrally. And when you have a centrally funded healthcare intervention or a formally reimbursed intervention as the system they have in Germany, for example, as I understand it, then it has a massive impact on healthcare provision. And it's the patients that benefit from this. And the reason I raise this is because uh, I'll speak to this in terms of paediatric auditory brain cell implantation as well. And just to give you some context, and I want you to remember that this bit, the, the bit in red, that if you have a congenitally deaf child, bilaterally, with no additional disabilities, and they have a cochlear implant before the age of two, bilateral cochlear implantation, before the age of two, the likelihood is that they will, in most instances, develop age-appropriate speech and language by the time they're five years old. Therein lies the miracle. And just that's the outcome from cochlear implants in many, many children. And I just want you to remember that because I'm going to show you that that's not what we achieve in paediatric auditory brainstem implantation. And then you hopefully will see why we do still nevertheless do it. And just very briefly, um, this child will then go on to have enhanced education, enhanced employment opportunities, and will probably pay back what you and I paid for them to have it in their tax returns for their whole life. So it actually makes financial sense as well if you take a long-term view on it. Now, you will know that here's a, here's a schema, schema of the, the, the way the cochlea is set up, and you will know that um, probably a cochlear implant stimulates the spiral ganglion cells themselves in the, in the cochlea itself. And so you have to have a functioning set of spiral ganglion cells and therefore a functioning auditory nerve and functioning higher auditory pathways in the brain for a cochlear implant to work. There are instances where the cochlea is either not available, perhaps due to a disease process, uh, such as severe ossifying meningitis, severe destructive otosclerosis, or it's congenitally absent. Or there are instances where the cochlear nerve itself is not available, the auditory nerve is not available, uh, either because it's congenitally absent or because of disease processes, typically NF2, and the impact of the tumours and surgery to remove them. And in those situations, you will consider stimulating the cochlear nuclei in the brainstem themselves using this technology, which is what the business end of an auditory brainstem implant looks like. So it's different from a cochlear implant, which is a linear array of electrodes, as you know. This is a paddle of electrodes. Uh, this is the one that we uh, currently use from Medel. Um, and this goes into the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle, which is eponymous. What's the name of the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle? The foramen of Lushka. Yeah, the only reason we've got a foramen of Lushka is so that we can put a brainstem implant in. That's not strictly true, of course. Okay. And so the indications for ABI, as I've said, in acquired disorders such as NF2, and the experience was gained primarily, was it gone? No. It was primarily in adults and some children as a consequence of this sort of problem. But in the non-NF2 group, it's predominantly been children and some adults due to, for example, absence of the eighth nerve. The only nerve in that internal meatus is the facial nerve. Okay. So let's have a look at that in more detail. Well, how many children are we talking about? Well, we don't really know. We will in the fullness of time as we look at the data retrospectively, but the likelihood is that for every 100 children that we get referred to our auditory implant programs up and down the country, perhaps one of them is not suitable for a cochlear implant because they haven't got an eighth nerve or they haven't got a cochlear or combinations thereof. So we're talking very small numbers. But... Until this technology was uh, introduced, there wasn't really much else we could do in terms of giving them access to sound. Uh, so the non-NF2 indications are essentially congenital, as I've described, but can be acquired where you have cochlear or auditory nerve pathologies. And as the global experience of these handful of cases accrued, our colleague uh, in Turkey, uh, Levent Sanaroglu, 
supported by uh, teams from all over the world, as you can see there, convened a consensus meeting uh, in Istanbul in 2010, I think it was. So we all went there and we talked through our experiences and what we thought was the uh, appropriate way forward. And we generated the first consensus statement, which was published in 2011, in order to try and help uh, the, the whole process at an international level. Great example of international collaboration. And then, having done that for a few years, we then met again uh, in the Northern Territories of the island of Cyprus and um, came up with a second consensus meeting as well. And you can see there is a broad international representation at these meetings, uh, particularly uh, representation from uh, the programme from Manchester, which was there right at the start, as I'll show you, and of course, uh, subsequently from London as well. And the summary of the second consensus, I think, is really important. It em emphasises the MDT aspect of this. These are really complex children, infants, that need to be assessed. Um, if you have, uh, and the team has to have experience of not just cochlear implantation, but skull-based uh, surgery. If you have a child with a thin eighth nerve, then we would, at this moment in time, put a cochlear implant in first, and if there is no benefit after a certain period of time, uh, we would then consider an ABI. Uh, and that's our situation at the moment. The optimal age for ABI, there, we know very well in, in cochlear implantation, the earlier you implant a child, the greater the ultimate benefit. Uh, and the thing about ABI is there's no equipoise when it's compared to cochlear implantation. A cochlear implant surgery in the hands of an experienced team is a straightforward procedure. An ABI has more challenges and has potentially greater risk. And so if you balance the surgical and anaesthetic risk against benefit, then I think the optimal age for an ABI is 18, perhaps even 24 months just to get that balance. Um, and you must manage the expectations of family. I'll come back to this very shortly. Um, the majority do get auditory perception. Uh, and there is no doubt that those that have no additional disability do better than those that do have additional cognitive or physical disabilities. So let's have a look at some of the, uh, the instances where we may consider it. Now, this, this is a really important paper because Levent and Araglu has essentially uh, written a paper that looks at all the different types of congenital abnormalities of the cochlea and classified them in this way. It builds on, on Jackler's classification that goes back 20 years. And the group that we're particularly interested in, of course, are those that have no inner ear or have no cochlea, but some sort of broad internal meatus and perhaps a bit of a vestibular organ. And those um, essentially are the ones where one would consider an ABI because you can't put a cochlear implant in. And then when it comes to the nerves themselves, well, this is the normal. Here's a T2 axial MR showing the cochlea, vestibule, a bit of a semicircular canal. You can see the auditory nerve going straight into the cochlea there. This is what we like to see. When you do a, a parasagittal section of the internal meatus, you've got all four nerves, the two vestibular nerves, the facial nerve, and the cochlear nerves. Those are your four nerves. There are instances where there's only one nerve. And there you can see the facial nerve in the, uh, the antra, uh, superior compartment there. That's relatively straightforward. This is a really tough group, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the kids with thin nerves. What do you do with them? Uh, but that essentially is a well-defined indication. So we call those group one. Basically, no inner ear, no cochlea, no nerve, or there is an instance, and this is where you have to understand your imaging well, there are instances where uh, the cochlear aperture, where the cochlear nerve would normally go into the cochlea, is just a bony partition. And so that's another group where you would consider, radiologically speaking, an ABI in, in a child like this. Um, looking back, okay, so that's very straightforward. Now let's just have a look at the hyperplasia group. So this is group two, and, and I've highlighted this in red. This is from our consensus statement. This is tough because there's no clear-cut answer as to what you do with these children. But... Um, we define it as, as a cochlear nerve that is less than 50% of the usual size. And the question is, what do you do in that situation? Um, and so we could generate a null hypothesis that in cochlear nerve hyperplasia, the outcome from cochlear implantation and ABI are the same. So you might then consider doing the less invasive procedure. 
Uh, so how do we decide with the two? Well, we may look at the audiometric evaluation, electrophysiological testing, the imaging, and potentially ele invasive electrophysiological evaluation. And one of these tests is to use this little golf club electrode. So in a child, it would be under general anesthesia, whereby you place this in the round window niche and stimulate electrically and try and generate some sort of brainstem response. Um, we're getting to the point, and again, this, uh, particularly the data that comes from the Manchester group, we're getting to the point where the sensitivity and the specificity of that test is probably good enough to say, if you don't get a response, go straight for an ABI. If you do get a response, go for a cochlear implant. But at the moment, I think we're all a bit nervous about making such a drastic decision based on this test. And the best test to see if that hyperplastic cochlear nerve will work with a cochlear implant is to put a cochlear implant in. It's an expensive test, but that's probably the best we've got at the moment. So let's have a look at some of the data in terms of outcomes of hyperplastic and uh, aplastic cochlear nerves. This was a survey we published across the country. It's getting old now, uh, published in 2010, looking at uh, 11 programs that responded 28 children. Uh, it's a relatively low level of evidence. Uh, and you can see that there were mainly hyperplasia uh, in that group. Um, most had a cochlear implant, some had no intervention, uh, a couple had ABI. Um, those, not, that you don't, those of you that don't work in this field may not be aware of this, but we have this uh, fairly useful tool called co Categories of Auditory Performance to look at the outcomes from cochlear implants in children. And so you go from a complete unawareness of environmental sounds, so that would be zero, through to a child that can use the telephone, particularly with familiar voices. And most cochlear implant children, uh, as I said earlier, will be five or six and occasionally seven. So just, just remember that bit, okay? Uh, if we look at the CAP scores then for that group, you can see that for the hyperplastic nerves, the, the median CAP score was four. So they don't do as well as the child that has a normal cochlear nerve. And if we look at some of the other data that come from Levance and Araglu, looking at auditory brainstem implantation, um, you can see that uh, a couple of children recognize some words but most of them, it was mainly auditory perception and no more than that. Again, from Coletti's group, uh, which includes the, the NF2 and other acquired pathologies, as well as the congenital ones, 31 children there, uh, you can see that the, uh, the speech discrimination scores uh, are, are, are fairly low and uh, there is a high instance of something we call non-auditory stimulation because if you put electricity in someone's brainstem, you're also going to start stimulating other cranial nerve sensors as well, and that's an issue. Um, so going back to our CAP score again, just to remind you, uh, if we look at this paper from uh, Korea, I think, in the non-tumor ABI cases, you can see that um, they're not getting CAP 5, 6, and 7. It just doesn't happen with an ABI. What's the situation in the UK? Well, as I said, it was pioneered by Richard Rams in the first three cases in 2005, and at this moment in China, time, there have been nine, further, uh, nine in total implanted in Manchester, eight in our programme in London, a couple in Cambridge. Um, and there's a, there's a host of children that, particularly Manchester, are looking after that have had implants elsewhere as well. Um, and of those children that we've implanted, we've evaluated 34 children. And I think the reason this slide is important is because this is really important. ABI not offered. And... The reason for doing that may well be multifactorial, the reasons, or it may just relate to the age of the child at presentation. If they're turning up at 9, 10, 11 years old, with congenital bilateral profound deafness, it's too late. But from the family's point of view, the parents essentially have, can go away in the knowledge that they explored every single <coughs> avenue for their child. And those of you that are parents understand exactly what I'm saying there. Uh, and so it's an important group to evaluate, even if they don't have a, end up having an ABI. Just uh, the, the sort of summary of the children that we've implanted in London thus far. And you can see uh, this one was very recent, but the, the, essentially all the children are using their device. Um, and the device that we use at the moment, the Medal device, has 12 channels on that paddle that I showed you. And you can see that the intraoperative responses that you get in terms of how many channels uh, doesn't necessarily bear any clear 
uh, relationship with the number of channels that ultimately the child will use. Um, they are vocalizing. Uh, this child, the first one we did in 2013, I, I'll show you a little bit more about. Um, so this was the case, and essentially uh, what this child had was um, no cochlear and no eighth nerves, uh, underwent uh, surgery at the age of 23 months, uh, and switched on about a month later, exactly. She was switched on on her second birthday, as it happens. Um, and she's reached uh, CAP3 about a year later. Uh, and then if we have a look at uh, how she's doing, this was her scan, by the way, T2 axial weighted MRI. You can see there's a very narrow internal meter. It's a bit of a vestibular entity, but no cochlea as such. This was uh, an example of surgery. So this is a posterior fossa craniotomy, and we're looking in there, and, and you can see that this is the brainstem here, the cerebellum is under here, and you see this area, that you see the choroid plexus coming out of the foramen of Lushka, you see CSF coming out there, and then you know you're getting to an even whiter area where the, where the cochlear nuclei are. You haven't got an eighth nerve to guide you to where the cochlear nuclei are. So you need to work it out in relation to the facial nerve and the lower cranial nerves, which are also good guides as well. There, you can see the cochlear nuclei beautifully there, uh, and then uh, this is the paddle then trimmed to size with the Dacron mesh around it. And it's helpful to put the paddle in the right way around so the contacts are facing the cochlear nuclei. It tends to work better. Um, and then you need to sort of keep it there with a bit of tissue or muscle or what, whatever. And this is that child. You can see that if you did a hearing test through the ABI, there was very little low frequency response. But look at the high frequency responses through the ABI there, which is really important for... <laughs> Uh, language acquisition. And so this was now 17 months post-activation. I'm hoping this will work. And I'm hoping there's sound. Try it. Sure, Daddy, what you've got? Liar. Sure, Daddy. What's that? Is that chocolate? Come in, do you want me to open it? Oh, wow! Go. Wow! Wow! She's really interested Go in wow. the chocolate, but she's Go responding ba, 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 to ba, ba, sound ba, ba. as well. That's yeah. about it. Ba, about ba, ba, ba. Cap 2. Okay? And that's 17 months Leia. of habilitation. Go girl. Go ba, 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 ba. And then if we look at four years later. <laughs> no, dada. Dada. Mummy. So she's now cap five. Bye. What about Tia? Yeah. What about more? Bye. No, more. Bye. More. So she's got what about frequency access. Shoes. She's vocalising. Shoes. She's a shoes. mixture of shoes. looking at the face, shoes. listening and signing. But she communicates. She's in the listening world and she communicates. And on, I think it was on her... Sixth birthday or something, she... We've got a video of her singing happy birthday, but anyway, there you go. So what ha happens in London, and actually this happens up and down the country now, is that a child is referred for cochlear implantation to one of the auditory implant programs, up and down the country, of which there are 19 or 20, I think. They do their usual assessment, and in London it would be, these are the four auditory implant programs, they would do their formal assessment, and if they find that, that the child is one of those one in a hundred that is not suitable for a cochlear implant for reasons that I've explained, then they will refer into the ABI service uh, that we've set up in London, which is a collaboration between UCL and Guy St. Thomas's, um, and then they go through a process that may end up with auditory brainstem implantation. So that was an informal, individual funded, individual funding request process. Uh, as it was in Manchester and in Cambridge as well. And then what N NHS England decided uh, was that actually we need to formalise this, which was a great step forward. And it goes back to what I said about central funding. They decided we need to formalise this because it needs to be structured and we need to make sure that those children that may be suitable for an ABI are identified and go through the process in a structured manner so that no, no children fall through uh, the net, so to speak. So a working group was convened uh, from these four centres, as you can see, um, and we went through a whole process of writing service quality indicators and service specifications and quality indicators and so on. 
Uh, so, uh, and by December 2016, um, that, that process was well underway. It was related to congenital abnormalities of the auditory nerves or cochlea, um, completed in autumn 2017, and there was a procurement uh, notification of procurement of services in mid-2018. And the current situation is that if a child like this is identified anywhere in England, Simon, is that right? England, isn't it? Yeah. Then uh, they, there is a responsibility of the auditory implant program to refer the child for consideration for ABI either to the program in Manchester or, or in London. And, and I think that's a great development because I think it will capture the children that could benefit from an ABI. And also... Uh, take away uncertainty for the family, for the children where, who may not benefit from an ABI. So to summarise and finish then, it's a challenging healthcare intervention. The management of the expectations of the family are critical. The family need to understand that these children are not going to be like the cochlear implant kids that I alluded to earlier. Uh, at the moment, about one in two potential candidates children end up having an ABI. I think that number might increase because the, the, uh, the capture of children at an earlier stage will improve. Uh, it, it is challenging, not just for the surgeons, but for the auditory implant team as a whole, because the habilitation is, is a real challenge. Uh, the literature, as it is, is showing that it's safe and efficacious. Uh, and this is the critical thing. I think all, all cochlear implant programs, auditory implant programs up and down the country have a moral and ethical duty to refer these children to one of those two centres in this country <coughs> for consideration of ABI, uh, so that everything that could be done for that child uh, is being done. And then just to acknowledge, acknowledge a lot of people that I've worked with over the years who have um, informed my experience and expertise in this particular area. And those are the service specifications uh, which are available on the NHS England websites. Okay, thanks.